This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. One of my favorite video games when growing up was, well, any Legend of Zelda game, but of those, my favorite was the first one I played, the Ocarina of Time. And for anyone who's played that, you may recognize this part here. It's not a big part of the game, as all you have to do is get past the guards without them seeing you. And clearly, since you can accomplish this, the area the guards are supposed to protect isn't very secure. Well, mainly because they're not very bright. But regardless, think about this question. What if we wanted the entire region to be secure at any time? So no matter where you are, a guard could see you. How many guards would be needed then? Well, here three would be enough, assuming they had decent peripheral vision. Two in the corners and one somewhere in the middle to protect that region. But what if that area got a little more complicated? Well, this takes us to something known as the art gallery problem, a visibility problem in computational geometry that has been studied for years. And by the way, computational geometry has some cool applications for anyone who may find this interesting. But anyway, the general question for the art gallery problem is what is the minimum number of guards needed to observe the entire gallery at the same time? This question is both easy, and by easy I mean like understandable, and also hard, and I'll explain what that means later. But for now we're going to go through a really elegant proof. In fact, this proof was even included in a book called Proofs from the Book, in which some of the greatest mathematical proofs are published. But let me give more detail to this problem. First, we will only be using polygons as our galleries, as in straight edges and there will be no internal walls separating rooms or anything like that, just a closed polygon. Then for the guards, we will assume they cannot move, so they are stuck in one place. However, they can see in all directions at once. Yeah, it might make more sense to use 360 degree cameras instead of guards, but we're going to stick with the guards. This means, for example, any of these shapes here could be completely observed with just one guard since with that 360 degree vision, they could see the whole thing. Even for a strange non-regular polygon like this, we'd still only need one guard. In fact, we already have our first theorem. For any convex polygon where every internal angle is less than 180 degrees, one guard is sufficient to observe the entire gallery. But even when we have a concave polygon with internal angles greater than 180, it could still be possible to use only one guard for the whole thing. But it's once things get more complicated that the general intuition goes away, and we need a more rigorous approach. Now, this gallery here has several vertices, and I think it's definitely safe to say if we put a guard at every one of those, then the entire gallery would be protected. No matter where a thief is, a guard could see them since every internal spot is in sight of at least one vertex. This would be a more than fair upper limit for a polygon with n vertices, n guards are required to observe the whole thing, but of course that's pretty excessive. Well, it turns out the well-known upper limit, which we're about to prove, is that for a polygon with n vertices, the worst case scenario is n over 3 guards, where you round down if you get a decimal, are required to observe the entire thing. Also, this is assuming that guards can only be placed at the corners, which we will assume for the remainder of the video. So for a 10-sided polygon like this, just divide that by 3 and round down since we get a decimal, which tells us that 3 guards is all we need to observe the entire gallery. As an example, these 3 guards alone would be enough to see everything. But remember, this is a worst case scenario. You may have noticed that this guard would actually be unnecessary. Everything he can see, the guard on the left can see as well. So really, 2 guards are good enough for this. We still can't make our general theorem any stronger though because of shapes like these with a comb-like structure. In this case there are 10 vertices as well, but we have to have 3 guards to observe the whole thing. 2 would not be enough. To prove this n over 3 upper limit, the first thing we need to do is prove that any polygon can be triangulated, or broken up into triangular regions with internal non-intersecting line segments. The reason this is important is because any guard at one of those corners can see the areas covered by the triangles sharing that vertex. I mean, yeah, they could see more as well, but their vision will definitely cover the triangles. Now, how do we show that this applies to any polygon? Well, I really like this next part because a lot of what I'm going to say will seem trivial, yet it still leads to the fact that yes, any polygon can be triangulated. Like, the first thing we need to show is that any triangle can be triangulated. 
All right, we're done with that because of course it can be, it's a triangle, it's already triangulated. It's very trivial yet it needed to be set. Then the only other thing we need to show is that for some arbitrary polygon, I can connect two vertices with a line segment which lies inside the polygon. Like that's it, I just need to show that one of these exists for any polygon. That seems so obvious it shouldn't even require a proof. But to do so, take any vertex that has an internal angle less than 180 degrees, which is guaranteed to exist in a polygon by the way, then go to the two adjacent vertices and one of two things will happen. One, you can simply connect them and we're done with the proof since we've connected two vertices. Or if instead we had started like here and done the same thing going to the two neighboring vertices, you'll find they cannot connect with an internal line segment. In this case, it simply means there must be at least one vertex within that region. And if you slide the segment closer to the initial vertex, you're eventually going to reach that closest vertex, which you can connect with the original. So there, for any polygon, there is some internal line segment I can draw that connects two vertices. This and the triangle being triangulated is pretty much all we need to show that any polygon can be triangulated. We just need to put it together through something called induction, which is like the proof equivalent of knocking over dominoes where one hits the next, then the next, and it goes on forever. I'll show the induction a little differently than you'd see in school, but to begin, again, any triangle or three-sided polygon can be triangulated because it already is. It's trivial, but that is like the first domino being knocked over. Then for any four-sided polygon, regardless of what it looks like, we know an internal diagonal can be drawn. That will guarantee it split the shapes into triangles, which are already triangulated because we proved that trivial case from before. Thus, any four-sided polygon can be triangulated. Then for a five-sided polygon, again, regardless of what it looks like, I know an internal segment can be drawn, which splits it into other polygons, all with less than five sides. And we've already proved those can each be triangulated, so if we just do that separately and connect the shapes back, the entire thing is triangulated. This will apply to any five-sided shape, thus another domino has fallen due to the first two being knocked over. See what's happening? We're taking a shape that we're not sure can be triangulated, like this is the six-sided case now, and we're splitting it up into smaller polygons, which is always possible, that we've already proved can be triangulated. Then we just connect the pieces back together to show that it does in fact apply to this new shape. So three sides was trivial, but we use that to prove the case with four, which was used to prove the case with five, and this will continue forever, like dominoes knocking each other over one at a time. Thus, any polygon can be triangulated because every domino will be knocked over. The next thing we need to do is show that any triangulated polygon is three colorable. Which means using only three colors, I can label every vertex such that no two connected vertices are the same color. With this, for example, pick any two connected corners and you'll see they're in fact different colors. The proof is kind of similar to what we just did. Any triangle can be tricolored, obviously. Then for any quadrilateral that's triangulated, I can split it up into multiple polygons, or in this case triangles, that themselves can each be tricolored, which we just saw. If I make the two connecting vertices to be the same color, then when I connect this back into the triangulated polygon, it's tricolored, because no two vertices that are connected have the same color. Then for a five-sided polygon that's triangulated, again, it can be split up along one of those internal segments, creating two polygons that definitely have four or less sides each. We know both of those are three colorable, which means that if we just choose the two vertices where we split the original shape to be the same color, then the entire thing will be tricolored when the polygons are put back together. This can then prove the case with six-sided polygons, which can be used for seven, and just like before, the dominoes would keep falling, thus any triangulated polygon is three colorable. Okay, time to finally put this together. You'll know with a three colored polygon like this that any of the segmented triangles contain all three colors. Pick any triangle you want, and the three vertices will each be a different one of the three colors. That means if we assign guards to any one of those colors, like let's say blue, that'll be enough to observe the entire gallery. 
Remember, every guard can see the triangles connected to their corner, and every triangle contains a blue corner. So like the rightmost guard could see this entire area taken up by those neighboring triangles, and yes, they could see more, but we're focused on these. The bottom guard could see these triangles, and the top guards could see their connected triangles, which covers the entire polygon. Four is not the minimum number of guards needed here, but that's not what we were after. We just wanted to show that the n over three rounded down was sufficient. Now, putting all the colors back, you'll see there are a total of six red, four blue, and four green, adding to a total of 14 vertices. The four blue are exactly our total vertices over three rounded down, the upper limit we were trying to prove this entire time. Well, regardless of the polygon, once it's three colored, one of those numbers has to be n over three rounded down or less. Imagine if that weren't the case. Imagine if the three colors added to, we'll say, 14 vertices, and all those numbers were greater than 14 over three rounded down. That means they'd all be five or more, which would exceed the 14 vertices. There's a contradiction there. And this finally completes the proof. To sum everything up, any polygon can be triangulated, and from there it can be three colored. Of the three colors which will sum to the total number of vertices, at least one of them must be less than or equal to the total number of vertices over three rounded down. If we assign guards to that color, it's enough to observe the entire gallery. Thus, this is how many guards are sufficient to observe any polygon. Now, if you're wondering what about the actual minimum number of guards for any polygon, not just the worst case scenario? Well, that's where things get hard. By that, I mean certain versions of this at least, like guards being forced to corners, are classified as NP hard problems. That's an entire video in itself, but basically just realize there's no efficient algorithm for solving that problem at the moment. In the future there might be, but right now we're just not sure. Then lastly, I want to thank CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. If you guys are interested in knowing more about the future of what our world will look like, I just came across a new series called Dream the Future, which I definitely recommend. This contains several episodes including cities of the future, homes of the future, transportation of the future, and more. These will show you the technologies being worked on right now that are going to have the most profound effect on the future of humanity and will change the way we live our everyday lives. Augmented reality, drone technology, possible methods of transportation, and way more are all included. So if you're interested in technology and what the future has in store, you should definitely check these out. Now, CuriosityStream hosts thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles within a variety of other topics, including physics in the universe, history, nature, engineering, and more. The service is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and more, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. Plus, if you go to curiositystream.com slash majorprep or click the link below and use the promo code majorprep, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in just giving it a try. This gives you unlimited access to top documentaries and nonfiction series that I know many of you will find very interesting. So again, links are below, and with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit the bell if you're not being notified, and I'll see you all in the next video.